Ah, yes, the man of the people, Rishi Sunak, who doesn't even know how to fill up his own car, doesn't even seem to know how to use a credit card, who treats the entire nation as a flyover state, as he flips from one place to another in his helicopter, who travels between his multiple homes, including one that he keeps in London solely for guests to stay in. This is an immensely privileged man, the richest man in Parliament, who claims that he's pursuing his policies for the sake of the working man and woman, the man and woman in the street. That's why I'm against ULES, the ultra-low emission zones. That's why I'm against all these other green measures, even 20 mile an hour zones, solely for the sake of you, the ordinary person who I emote with and connect with so strongly from a thousand foot up in my helicopter, but who is really representing the dirtiest of all industrial interests. You cannot understand politics in this country or indeed in any other without grasping an essential insight into how it works that is called the pollution paradox. And the pollution paradox works as follows. The industries and the billionaires and oligarchs with the greatest incentive to invest in politics are those involved in the dirtiest and most antisocial businesses. Those who are causing the pollution, those who are treating their workers like shit, those who are exploiting their consumers, those who are dumping their costs onto society. These are the people with the greatest incentive to invest in politics because if they don't, they'll be regulated out of existence because people don't like them. People will vote against their interests if they get the chance. And as a result of that, and this is a crucial point, politics comes to be dominated by the dirtiest and most antisocial companies. And the political parties which win elections are those which are backed by the dirtiest and most antisocial companies. And that is where the Conservatives are today. And look, if that sounds conservative, then let me tell you, I don't care. Somebody has got to stand up for the things that make this country great. And it isn't going to be the Tories. Keir Starmer's entire shtick seems to be, don't worry, Rupert Murdoch, I'm not coming for you. What appalling cowardice. What a collapse in the face of oligarchic power. This guy is no Democrat. He does what the plutocrats tell him to do, and that makes him a plutocrat. He goes on TV and in the media publicly to beat up environmental activists. He attacks Just Stop Oil on the completely mistaken idea that they're trying to stop the use of all fossil fuels immediately from day one. In fact, what they're trying to do is to stop the exploitation of new sources of oil and gas. Now, some optimistic people say, well, you know, Keir Starmer might be lousy in opposition, but once he's in government, then he's going to toughen up. No, sorry. If it's not in your manifesto, you don't then have a mandate to do it. And already he's tying his own hands. He says he's going to stick to Tory spending rules, just like the ill-fated Ed Miliband campaign was going to do. Why? When Tory spending rules are trashing this country, when they've destroyed our public services, he won't be able to spend the money required to create the green transition that we need. And sticking to Tory fiscal rules, of course, also means that you leave economic structures intact. You don't do anything about the massively rising inequality. And that means that you're not taking a neutral position. You are siding with the rich against the poor. You are siding with the few against the many. My Labour Party is unashamedly pro-business. Just Stop Oil is right and the government is wrong. But because Just Stop Oil is trying to defend our lives against the fossil fuel companies, it finds itself at odds with the politicians who are sponsored by those fossil fuel companies. Recently, the Tory party has taken £3.5 million from pollutocrats. It is unequivocally on the side of the fossil fuel companies, so it uses Just Stop Oil as a whipping boy, as a scapegoat, as a way of defining itself against something. It says, we're not like those people who are interfering with you, the God-fearing, decent, working men and women of this country who we stand shoulder to shoulder with while we're a thousand feet up in our helicopter. We are against those scuzzy people who are trying to stop you from getting to work. But actually what those scuzzy people are trying to do is to permit human life to continue. It's to permit 
the habitable planet to be sustained because they're following the science and the science says we have to leave the oil and gas in the ground. We can't open up any reserves which haven't already been opened. But Rishi Sunak has completely ignored that advice. The advice not just of the International Energy Agency, not just of the world's climate scientists, the advice of his own advisers, such as the Climate Change Committee of the UK government. And the really shocking aspect of all this is that Sunak has done it just for a few good headlines, for the most trivial and ephemeral gains, for a few more months of his own personal political survival, he is undermining the welfare of the entire human species. It doesn't get much lower than this. Politicians nowadays are always pursuing the wedge issue. This is the Linton Crosby strategy, the Tory strategist who says, we've got to find the issue which divides people away from the Labour Party and onto your side. And it doesn't matter what the issue is. You know, it can be a culture war issue, immigration, asylum, those always work well. Now they've latched onto the green agenda as a wedge issue. And it's not through any conviction that Sunak is doing this. It's simply to create another wedge issue. It's another part of the spectrum of political warfare that the Tories are engaging in. They always tell you, oh, it's impossible. We can't make that change. And other people aren't, so why should we be the ones to do it? And in fact, the UK has fallen way behind other countries, including countries much poorer than ourselves. I mean, the world leader in environmental policy is Costa Rica with a fraction of our GDP, but it's done extraordinary things. Its forest cover has gone from 24% to 57% in just a few decades through brilliant foresight and the environmental policies which follow from that. Even France, just across the channel, is doing extraordinary things to try to transform itself into an ecological civilization. It's not perfect by any means, of course it isn't, but it's way, way ahead of where we are. We are now being left behind in the fossil age. It is not because it's good for us, far from it. It's very bad for us indeed. It's because of corruption. It's because the government is effectively owned by fossil fuel interests. This isn't just a question of what happens to our children and grandchildren. We will start to see the effects in our own lifetimes. We're already seeing massive fires across large parts of the planet. We're seeing huge heat domes with devastating heat waves, which have already killed thousands of people through heat exhaustion. And now we're seeing even more alarming signs, a massive sea surface temperature anomaly, like nothing we've ever seen before, which could lead to the collapse of marine food chains. We've already begun to see massive storms and floods, which have been greatly exacerbated by climate breakdown. We're seeing in the Antarctic ice melt, which is just completely off the charts. A few weeks ago, one of the most important scientific papers ever published was released. It said that we have greatly underestimated the chances of what's called simultaneous breadbasket failure, which basically means that very large numbers of people will not be able to eat adequately. Now, this paper got five mentions in the media anywhere on Earth. A scandal about a British TV personality called Philip Schofield got 10,000 news stories dedicated to it. In the media, celebrity gossip is literally considered thousands of times more important than what are objectively and obviously the most important stories on earth. And that applies right across the media and right across our politics. So we're faced at this moment by these two existential crises. The existential crisis facing humanity as a result of environmental breakdown. The existential crisis facing the industries causing that breakdown, the fossil fuel industry, meat industry, internal combustion industries, and the others, which have to be regulated out of existence. Only one of us can win. And if they win, in the long run, everybody loses. The media thinks that celebrity gossip is thousands of times more important than environmental breakdown. Well, at Double Down News, we have a different view. We think that what is important should be salient and what is salient should be important. So please support us by becoming a patron through Patreon. Thank you.